Hello, everyone, and welcome to the November 2022 Tarjan Center Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Jasper Estabio, Director of Training for the Tarjan Center, and it's my pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, as a reminder, we offer live Spanish interpretation, and for those who are interested, you can click on the interpretation button on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar and then select Spanish. Um, please also enter your questions for our speaker into the Q&A function throughout the talk, um, also on your toolbar, as we'll facilitate discussion at the end of our talk today. Um, after today's presentation, please also be sure to complete our evaluation survey. Um, we get lots of feedback and we love to hear from our audience in terms of what topics they're interested in and how we can better serve the needs of everyone um, who is interested. And so please be sure to um, give, our, you our, <laughs> give our feedback into the survey. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker, Dr. Jamie Barstein. So Dr. Barstein is a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in the assessment and treatment of individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities, such as autism spectrum disorder across the lifespan. While trained as a child and adolescent psychologist, Dr. Barstein is well-versed in working with individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities across the lifespan. She's received extensive training in multidisciplinary and evidence-based assessment and treatment through her doctoral program at Northwestern University, doctoral internship at JFK Partners, the University of Colorado's Leadership and Education and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities, or LEN program, and her postdoctoral fellowship at the HELP Group and UCLA Semmel Institute. Dr. Barstein currently provides clinical care through Spectrum Psych Los Angeles, a group private practice in Los Angeles where she completes comprehensive diagnostic evaluations, as well as provides individual and family therapy for neurodivergent children and adults. Additionally, Dr. Barstein is a supervising psychologist at the HELP Group, where she supervises doctoral and postdoctoral level trainees. Dr. Barstein is an LGBTQIA plus affirming therapist who's developed a subspecialty in working with autistic individuals for exploring their sexual and gender identity. Dr. Barstein leads sex education groups for adolescents and young adults with ASD, and she's passionate about developing effective sex education programming and supports for neurodivergent adults. Dr. Barstein recently piloted a novel sex education program for young adults with ASD in collaboration with Dr. Eileen Crayon at Tufts University. She plans to relaunch a modified version of the group in January 2023 with Spectrum Psych, Psych Los Angeles. And with that, please uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Jamie Barstein. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I am very excited to be here. Let me just go ahead and share my screen so we are all set. Great. Perfect. And this should be right. So if anyone <laughs> sees something different, let me know. Thank you. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. The reality is that I could um, talk for hours about this topic. I'm, I'm very passionate about um, healthy sexual development for neurodivergent or autistic individuals. Um, so in the interest of time, I am going to focus on really the importance of uh, sex education for this population. Um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, the importance of sex education for this population, and then also um, some practical tips for providers and parents. Um, note that I will be using identity first language throughout this uh, presentation. I'm going to be referring to autistic people or neurodivergent individuals. Um, and I appreciate your understanding if I slip. I'm working on being most inclusive of respectful of the autistic self-advocate population who is advocating for a preference for um, people first language. I also do want to acknowledge that much of what I'm going to talk about today it comes from my work, as um, Dr. Estevio mentioned, it comes from my work with Dr. Eileen Crehan, who's at Tufts University. And in particular, we recently adapted an evidence-based sex education program. It's called Tackling Teenage Training. And it was developed by Drs. Visser, Decker, and Greaves Lord. And if we have time at the end, I'd be happy to talk more about how I've adapted that program for young adults. Um, and yeah, certainly happy to do that if we have time at the end. So for just a second, and I really like to start any talk about sex education um, in this way, is I want everyone just to take a moment and think, where did you learn about sex? 
where did you learn about sexual development? So that is if each one of these bubbles represented a person or a place that you learned about sex, what would you fill in? What person or place would be the largest for you? And for a moment, we're gonna turn the chat on um, and I'll let folks kind of write into the chat. Um, can be, you know, one or two word answers of just where do you remember learning about sex and sex education? So I see someone wrote at school, chat is disabled, it says. So maybe right into the Q&A. Peers, friends, someone from a book, it's perfectly normal. Friends, friends, seeing lots of friends, family, great. School that doesn't remember the lessons. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you everyone for participating in this and, and kind of remembering where you really learned about sex. And for some people, it might be, you know, this is where I learned kind of the facts, but the more nuanced pieces might have been in, in different places. So everyone's looks a little bit different. Um, mine personally might look something like this. Um, so I, I learned the vast majority of what I you know, especially as an adolescent and a, an adult knew and know about sex from peer groups. Um, and so many of you are writing that, right? Like peers, family, um, summer camp <laughs> was a really big one for me, uh, which was my peer support group, right? And so a lot of you are writing similar things in the chat that that's where, or in the Q&A, where that's where you really learned, even though some of you are mentioning parents in school, I see vast majority. And what I usually hear is vast majority is really from their peers. So then the question, and I want everyone to keep this in mind as we talk more and more about the importance of sex education and as well as the um, influence of core symptoms of autism on the access to sex to information about sex. So then the question is, okay, where do autistic people learn about sex? Well, research shows that autistic adults in comparison to their same age peers who are non-autistic are more likely to report learning about sex from, her, excuse me, are less likely to report learning about sex from social sources. And women in particular are reporting gaining most of their knowledge from the, e from the TV, from the internet, from external sources. There was a recent study by Dr. Crehan in 2021, and she found that 65% of autistic adults reported getting information about sex from websites, websites of unknown quality. So these are not .org, .gov. These are websites that are unknown in the quality or the validity of them. 11% are receiving reported receiving information about sex education from their providers, 16% from their parents. And then interestingly, there was a report that same age peers were consulted less often by autistic than the neurotypical group. So when we think about this, one of the things we want to think about is, well, what are the problems with some of these sources? First of all, television, media, internet are often not realistic depictions of sex, and misinterpretations are really common. I really appreciate um, this is a series of comics by an artist, Lauren Brantz. It's called Sex Spectation. Um, and they have lots of different little clips of sex spectation versus reality in which they depict various sexual activities or encounters typically that are presented in media, movies, television, um, and then the reality of what that might actually look like. Um, but but we know, right, that it's not always it's not always realistic in what's presented in these different sources. We also know that many of these sources are invalid. Think about Dr. Crehan's study. 65% of individuals reported gathering information from internet sources with unknown quality or validity. That's scary. That leads room for, for even more interpretations, things that we have to be mindful of. 
I saw a lot of people mention that they actually did learn information from schools, um, which is great. Um, the issue with sex education in schools for many autistic individuals is it's quite variable in the access to sex education. We know that research shows us that there continues to be um, more limited or variable access for autistic folks. Programs also tend to have a greater emphasis on abstinence. So I like this, um, <laughs> if anyone recognizes this little video clip or picture from Mean Girls. Um, and there's also a little emphasis on the social components. So again, let's think back. Lots of people were saying, I really learned about sex from my social sources. There's misinterpretations of social information and oftentimes sex education only includes facts and not those social components. There's often, there are often not accommodations as well. So even for our individuals who have high average superior IQ, they might still need accommodations that are more tailored to their learning style. And sex education often doesn't have these accommodations in place. Not to mention many sex education curriculums are only geared toward heterosexual relationships with cisgendered folks. This is very, very important to consider more broadly in sex education, but particularly for this neurodivergent autistic population in which gender and sexual minorities are more prevalent. Um, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of considering LGBTQIA plus identities in all sex education. And then finally, I saw some people mention that they learn from parents, um, and many of you might actually be parents of autistic teens, autistic young adults, autistic children, just parents of typical neurotypical children as well. What's the reality? It's really awkward, right? What am I supposed to teach? When do I teach it? How? Am I even the one who should be teaching this? And I think these are really great questions and thoughts. And I think the fact that so many people are here today, and I know we have a wide variety of people in the audience who are providers, researchers, family members, self-advocates. And I think so much of our work is helping to empower parents and empower providers and empower self-advocates, right? To feel more comfortable and confident either talking about sexual health or at least knowing who to turn to and how to advocate for yourself or your child or your client and getting access to this very important information. And that we should really be thinking of sexual health and sexual development as a core component of care for all individuals, especially individuals who are neurodivergent and who are autistic. So I also want to think about how core symptom of, symptoms of autism impact access to healthy sex education. So these are really the two main areas of deficits that we see in autism spectrum disorder. And I'm sure many of you know this and are well-versed in this, but just to review, social communication is one of the core deficits, right? So keeping in mind um, that the vast majority of you, including myself, said that, you know, peer groups is really where we learn the vast majority of our information. Well, think about how some of these social communication deficits, right? Social emotional reciprocity difficulties, theory of mind deficits, social reasoning challenges. Think about how often these lead to misinterpretations in social situations. Now let's add on the confusing nuances of dating and sex and relationships. Imagine that compounding misinterpretation, miscommunication, and confusion around these topics for individuals who are for neurodivergent or autistic individuals. We also, we also often hear that neurodivergent individuals don't have that same access to peer groups, something that programs such as the UCLA Peers Program are working really hard to change and to build social skills and to inherently build social groups as well. We also see that the presence of atypical behaviors, we also see the presence of atypical behaviors as another core component of autism. And we can understand how this can influence sexual behaviors and relationships as well. So things like stereotyped, routinized behaviors, highly fixated interest, atypical sensory processing, that in particular affects intimacy with yourself, intimacy with a partner. All of these things can potentially impact and influence an understanding of 
sexual behaviors, but also an understanding and um, engagement in some of these relationships. So taking this one step further, I wanna show how core impairments of autism can unfortunately lead to problematic outcomes. So if we think about a breakdown in theory of mind, right? That's the ability to understand how your behavior may appear. And in turn, that seems to increase the possibility of a problematic behavior that could reflect some sort of deviance. For example, socially odd or awkward behaviors misinterpreted as intentionally harmful, stalking, being highly fixated or obsessed with someone, um, molestation, right? Having less knowledge of privacy behaviors and how that might affect someone else. And so then displaying an inappropriate sexual behavior in a place that's not comfortable for others to be viewing that. This desire to have friends and be accepted that really can lead to placing in autistic individuals in risky and dangerous situations. So what I'm talking about is this concept called counterfeit deviance or naive curiosity in which behaviors occur not because someone is intentionally being deviant, but because they don't know better. And unfortunately, this can result in both sexual victimization as well as sex sexual perpetration for a um, dangerous level of our individuals, of our autistic individuals. Just to highlight this and give you some facts around this, um, what we see is that the risk of sexual abuse, being sexually abused or exploited, um, is high. Um, some of these statistics are quite alarming, right? 78% of autistic adults reported at least one occurrence of victimization. As children, they're reporting a higher incident of sexual assault by peers. As adults, a higher incidence of unwanted sexual contact, and autistic college students, students are twice as likely to experience unwanted sexual contact. And then the opposite, and this is a lot of where we talk about this, um, this you know, counterfeit deviance, is the risk of being accused of sexual crimes or of being a perpetrator, right? The developmental disability population more broadly is seven times more likely to have contact with the criminal justice system. And often autistic or the developmental disability population more broadly is retained, excuse me, this is specific to autistic individuals are retained for 11 years longer in psychiatric settings. So hopefully what I have done is not scared you, right? But really highlighted to you the importance of sex education. And so by doing that, I also want to review a few myths and a few facts. Um, myths include that autistic individuals don't have sexual drives or interests, that physical development is different in autistic individuals. There's actually only been one study to show that autistic females might have slight differences in physical development, but no other studies have confirmed that. Um, otherwise, it's thought that physical development um, is the same for autistic and neurotypical individuals. A myth that teaching about sex and sexuality could cause problems, not the case, and that sexual behaviors in autistic individuals is aberrant or wrong. Instead, the facts are that most autistic individuals have typical sexual or romantic feelings and desires, that autistic individuals absolutely have the right to learn sex education and engage in sexual activities. And this goes for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities more broadly. And that without proper education, autistic individuals may engage in socially inappropriate or dangerous ways to, fill, to fulfill their sexual and intimacy desires. I want us to think about sex education as preventative and proactive. All too often, sex education occurs as a result of a problematic behavior or occurrence. I can't tell you how frequently families come to me or come to other colleagues who do this work and say, unfortunately, my young adult, my child, my adolescent, whoever it is, has gotten in trouble with the law. Um, and that's when we intervene and provide that education. And my hope is that as we have a greater awareness and of the importance of sex education, we can incorporate this into our everyday practice. So it's really proactive and preventative rather than waiting for an issue to occur. Let's see, perfect. 
Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what to teach and how to teach it, keeping in mind that this is only a brief um, overview of some of the things that we want to think about teaching and the ways that we can teach it. Um, but I, at the end, I will provide a bunch of resources and I'm happy to share those with the group of here's some wonderful places to obtain more information um, about resources and what to teach and how to teach. Um, so sorry, I just lost my screen. Give me one second. There we go. Okay. So things that we want to think about teaching are the facts, skills, the terms, and the social aspects. And when we think about how we want to teach this, first of all, absolutely individualized to each individual, right? I mean, that's the case with any person that we're teaching or supporting. But we also do have knowledge of types of interventions and learning and teaching strategies that are effective for autistic learners. One of the biggest things is being explicit using the words, using the words, using the words, right? And this is a place where I think a lot of providers and parents feel uncomfortable. Um, and quite frankly, the clients and our autistic adolescents and adults feel really uncomfortable, right? And so being explicit though, and really using the terms and not dancing around the issues or the facts and really explaining this is how it works, right? This is what it looks like. All of those components are really helpful um, in teaching autistic learners. Um, breaking down larger concepts into more manageable pieces. The UCLA peers uh, for dating program does an excellent job of this and the UCLA peers program more broadly and saying, here's a concept, right, of dating. Dating is very involved, right? What are the skills and the um, and the uh, steps involved in just being able to get to that level of dating, right? And so really breaking it down into individual pieces. Visual supports, using images, using, using videos, um, using vignettes, so incorporating that social piece using uh, role play, examples from real life. And I have a star next to these two as our most recent study on the adaptation of the Tackling Teenage Training Program for the adult population highlighted that both role play and that discussion and real life examples were the most meaningful components of the program. Um, so in particular for this ad adult population, it's a, it was a small study, pilot study, um, but it's interesting to know that these were definitely two very important and meaningful components. Um, also the importance of returning to topics repeatedly and checking for comprehension and thinking about there's a difference between knowing the fact and knowing the rule and actually being able to generalize that into a real situation. And I hear this frequently with clients that I work with or their family members, right? Is that they can tell you the rule. They can label what was done wrong and what was done right, but actually incorporating that into every day um, that's what's more challenging. And so that's where those skills and those social aspects are really important. It's also important, as I mentioned, um, for all sex education programs to include LGBTQIA plus identities, but in particular for this neurodivergent autistic population, where we know that there's a higher rate of both gender variance and also identification as gender minority. We also know that there are higher rates of depression, anxiety, and other mental health concerns in autistic LGBTQIA plus individuals in comparison to heterosexual or cisgender autistic adults. This is likely due to the compounded stressors of both living in this society as autistic and as LGBTQIA+, but it highlights even more the importance of really considering um, the inclusion of this, these identities into our, into our sex education curriculums um, to try to provide more support and hopefully decrease um, some of those higher rates of mental health concerns. Ways that you can include LGBTQIA plus identities include your explanation of body parts and explanation of intercourse. Um, being mindful that sex, just the term sex, doesn't always involve penetration, particularly between two individuals who have female genitals. So it's important to discuss, right, what sex means, what sex could look like, and the difference of, of sex and or intercourse 
um, with or without penetration involving different types of genitals. Um, discussing both anal and vaginal intercourse. And then one thing that um, very few actual sex actually sex education programs include is intersex. Um, knowing that the intersex, um, in individuals who are intersex is actually higher than most might think. And so, um, and regardless is important to include in our uh, teaching of sex education. Also monitoring the terms we use, being mindful of not using absolute terms. Um, also using terms like individuals with female genitals rather than saying women, because the reality is someone's gender identity might not match their physical body parts, right? And so trying to be mindful of that language as well. Um, always asking individuals their preferred language, remaining open to new identities, new terms, asking questions, being curious, all these important clinical traits, um, seeking support and consultation when you might feel that you need it. And then of course, never assuming someone's sexual orientation or gender identity, right? It is always important to ask. So I'm going to turn back and give some more um, kind of practical tips around the ways we might teach some of these different um, different components. So first is facts, right? Remember I said facts, skills, and social components. So we'll start with facts, the body, right? Anatomy, puberty, pregnancy, sex with self, sex with others, sexually transmitted diseases and safe sex, personal hygiene, legal aspects, boundaries, and touch. Again, these are not comprehensive, but these are some of the examples of different topics that we might, that are important to consider. Things like medical terms versus slang terms, right? So one of the things that we do in our group is we say any term can be used here. And then we can discuss as a group whether it's something that would be appropriate, where it would be appropriate to use that term, right? Knowing that some terms are very offensive and we might want to say them in the group and make sure everyone knows the word, but also understands when and where to use it, right? And what are you going to hear in movies, in media, in various other places, right? Or in your peer group. Um, and so how can we talk about the terms in that way? Using actual images. Um, so we use in the groups that we run, we have images of various body parts and we really outline them and show them. And um, we'll use actual images of the variation in body parts, um, making sure individuals understand, again, what's portrayed in movie television media is oftentimes a very specific look, which is not the reality, right? So normalizing that there's variations, um, being explicit and teaching explicit laws, and then also this concept of public versus private, which I'll give some examples. So these are three different examples of um, ways in which we might teach this concept of public versus private. Um, so breaking it down, you know, really concretely on the left, you'll see um, that this has a rating of one to five of what different parts of the body can be touched and where they can do it. And we've also broken this down, um, and I've used this for families I've worked with who might have um, individuals in their, their, in their household who are more impacted or who really benefit from that use of visuals, or maybe they're younger as they're learning this, is a visual of where is okay to masturbate and where is not, right? So a stop sign on um, the bedroom door of you know, siblings room and a go sign on the bathroom door of their room. Um, I've also worked with teachers before in schools who are really having difficulty with this. And so making sure there are stop signs in the school system, the school environment as well. Um, but really breaking this down into helping individuals understand public versus private. And then I recognize that this is harder to see, but this is a, um, a reflection document that we used in um, our most recent group around masturbation, where we really asked adults to think and reflect. What are their own personal beliefs about masturbation? What's influenced beliefs about masturbation? Um, have you figured out what makes you feel excited when you're masturbating? You know, if you do masturbate and if you choose to masturbate and if that's something that is a part of your everyday um, or part of your, you know, routines, where do you feel comfortable doing that? And for a lot of um, 
adolescents and also adults who are autistic adults, they might be living at home or living with roommates, right? And so how do you let others in your household know when you need privacy? What does that look like, right? Do you, do you lock the door? Do you, um, you know, make sure you're going into a space at a certain time of day, but how do you make sure that you're respected in your home environment? Another example that I want to show that I, I really like as a resource is called sexetc.org. And this is another example of just being very explicit about laws. Um, so this is these are just screenshots from the website, um, but this essentially is a map and you can click on each state. So for this one, it's clicked on California. And it tells you about the laws and rights around topics of sex education, age of minority, age of consent. Um, and so this is a really important and useful tool to really make sure that individuals understand, yes, some of this is nuanced, but there are also some rules and laws that make things legal or illegal, including the age of consent, right? The age at which you can engage in sexual behaviors with someone who is or who's not that age. I'm also going to turn to different skills that that we want to teach right so expressing affection preventing exploitation dating consent self-advocacy and online safety again how do we do this vignettes role play role play role play group discussions peer support so here's a few examples of some of the ways that we might talk about boundaries um, and um, your own personal boundaries, your own personal comfort. So on the left-hand side, you'll see this is a table in which various situations are labeled. And we ask individuals to fill out what would feel comfortable for you in a friendship situation, in a dating situation, in a family situation, something like going to the movies together sleeping in a bed together, massaging each other, right? And really just trying to get individuals to start thinking about this. Um, and then the next step is the skill around how to really set those boundaries and self-advocate. Um, I also really like this example. This is from the Tackling Teenage Training Program in which we ask individuals to use, you know, kind of a stop card, red card or green card, go card saying, what makes you feel comfortable or uncomfortable, right? A professor gives you a pat on the back because you got a high grade on a test versus someone you've only met online asks you to send them a picture of yourself, right? What does that feel like? Is it comfortable? Is it uncomfortable? Does it overstep your boundary? Does it feel acceptable? Let's talk about this. Let's figure Figure this out. Um, and this is particularly important to consider the sensory component of boundaries and intimacy, right? So helping individuals understand and identify what they enjoy, what works for them, what doesn't. And again, that skill of how to advocate for yourself and discuss that with a partner. Um, I want to make sure that I highlight online safety. This is something that we are, you know, as a society really dealing with, and uh, not just for the autistic population, but for the, you know, society at large. And I really like this conceptual model by Dr. Lindsay DeVries and Dr. Caitlin Middleton, our psychologist at Children's Hospital of Colorado, who are doing some great work on um, a, a curriculum to teach parents Um to, to provide uh, parents with support around uh, sex education. And so they talk about online safety as really involving three different components, teaching skills, restricting access and monitoring. And I appreciate this because I think oftentimes we think of online safety as just, for example, restricting access, right? Like, okay, I don't think my child is ready for this. I think they're too young. I'm just gonna say no access. Two issues with this, once, um, was talking to, uh, earlier about this is that as each generation seems to be getting much better at technology, right? And so as soon as you put one firewall, there's something else that can happen, right? So monitoring is needed. But then the second issue with that is that you might be restricting access in one setting, but we don't really know what kind of information they're getting from other settings, right? From school, from um just being at the park, right? And listening to other people talking. And so we really wanna think about skills, right? What skills are necessary for someone to be safe online? Skills such as what's credible versus what's problematic. In our groups, we will do things like, what are some cues and signs of a fake profile, right? What are some cues and signs someone could be taking advantage of you? 
How do we determine if a website is reputable? If we don't know if a resource is reputable or we're unsure if someone is being safe with us, who do we ask? Who do we turn to, right? Um, online etiquette, what topics are okay and not okay to discuss. This concept of privacy, nothing is private on the internet, right? Um, knowing that even if we feel like it's private, if it's on the internet, there is a chance that it could become public, right? And then meeting in person, what's safe versus what's not safe. Also highlight this idea of consent. Um, and these are some examples of ways we might talk about both understanding your own comfort um, and again, bringing it one step further into that skill of learning how to advocate for yourself um, when you do or when you do consent to something or you don't consent to something. Um, there's a book called Girl Sex 101 that I think is great. And one of the concepts they talked about, they talk about is not just your physical safety, but your emotional safety as well. And they recommend doing something like a safer sex protocol, protocol, which on the right, again, apologies, it's kind of hard to see, but this is something that we um, create in our groups as well, right? And so, you know, ex here's some examples of how you might create a protocol so that you feel both emotionally and physically safe when you're engaging in sex or intercourse with a partner, right? And so for this example, it says asking my partner to test for sexually transmitted diseases, right? Testing myself. Um, discussing consent beforehand, using birth control. For some people, it might be being in a committed relationship, right? And so just knowing that this protocol might change, but really evaluating and determining how do I make sure that I feel physically and emotionally safe? And then we go to the social aspects, which are really incorporated into all of this. Um, but I do want to highlight that the social aspects of what to do, what not to do, how to do it, and why, right? These big pictures. Again, using things like vignettes, role play, group discussion, peer supports. So I will give two examples. Um, the first is I've referenced many times is the UCLA Peers Program has free videos that are examples of, and this is just a clip on the left of, this is just a, a glimpse of some of the videos that they have. There's actually three pages of them um, of dating, right? So asking someone on a date that's a bad example, asking someone on a date that's a good example. These are really great videos to incorporate into your teaching or parents to use with adolescents and young adults. Um, you know, really saying, let's take it, let's watch this. What wasn't good about it? What was good about it? Um, and then Planned Parenthood has some excellent videos as well. Um, I'm just going to show one, but honestly, in the interest of time, I think I'll save more time for questions and you can explore these later. Um, but they have really good videos too around, um, first of all, uh, LGBTQIA plus inclusive, which I really love. And then also um, a little bit, uh, they're also, you know, somewhat realistic in terms of what really might happen. So for example, in the video and when someone doesn't want to have consent, doesn't want to have sex, um, there's an example of two individuals who are kissing and one of them doesn't, you know, one of them, you know, wants to use a condom and the other one doesn't. And how do they have a conversation about that? Um, and so a lot of what we're talking about in our groups too, is things like coping with rejection, coping with peer pressure, normalization of sexual desires, and just what it's like to be in a relationship. Um, and those, those Planned Parenthood videos, the reason I, um, reference that is because, um, it's one thing, right, to have the skills to advocate for yourself and say no, um, but I think a second level of skills that we have to think about of these social aspects too are coping with either being rejected or feeling pressured, um, especially thinking about, right, those high rates of individuals who feel like they had unwanted sexual encounters um, and knowing, I mean, if you think in your head, maybe of a few individuals, you know, um, who just want so badly, we, you know, all teens do, but especially this autistic population in our society really wants to be accepted and wants to, you know, make friends and have a peer group is um, that peer pressure and that social pressure and really being mindful of that and how to cope with it and how to find the right, the right people um, to engage in these activities with. Um, normalization of sexual desires is something we talk about a lot in our group discussion. Um, it is 
uh, not uncommon. And in fact, it is very normal to not want to engage in sexual activities at all or with other people to feel asexual. Um, that is very normal and making sure, and, and it's not discussed a lot because it's oftentimes this, you know, well, everyone else is doing this and talking about it. So I guess I should be too. Um, and so, you know, really creating that normal and comfortable space to be able to say, it's okay if these aren't activities that you want to engage in. Um, and then again, like I said, the social aspects of really being in a relationship. So I do want to highlight a few consideration, considerations specific uh, for parents and providers, um, but a lot of times I do have parents ask, like, how do I create a safe space and how do I make sure that I'm doing this right? Um, again, um, Dr. DeVries and Middleton, uh, they, they have, you know, great programs and supports around that, but just some of the takeaways in my work is... Um, Oh, I realized I didn't switch slides, sorry, is providing a space that's free of judgment, right? And so one of the things that I often tell, um, I often talk to parents about is, um, you know, wouldn't you rather your child come to you with some kind of odd or atypical or different sexual desire or behavior then go try that out if it could be dangerous and or talk to people about it who might not be supportive. So the idea behind this isn't that you necessarily need to say to them all the time, right? Like, oh yes, that sounds like a great idea. Go for it. But at least say, I want to be this supportive space where you can talk to me. And if I'm not feeling comfortable with it, right? Maybe this is here, understanding your own comfort level, how your culture might influence your own beliefs and thoughts you know, helping your child or your client identify who they can turn to and who can help them if you feel like you are not the right person, right? And so I think that's a, a big thing to be thinking about as well, is that providing that safe and comfortable space, but also helping individuals find the space that's best for them, right? And maybe for parents and for providers, it's seeking support for yourself, Parenting is hard. Um, I I don't have an adolescent child, um, but you know I can only imagine. And in my work that I do, I know that parenting an adolescent is really challenging. And we add on these additions right around um, all these core components of autism and neurodivergence more broadly. And so making sure that you're getting support for yourself around these topics as well. So in sum, I um, hope I've highlighted sex education is very important for the neurodivergent population. Um, I'm encouraging parents and providers to consider sexual health as a core component of development, as a core component of, you know, um, of care for neurodivergent individuals and the importance of sex education being preventative and proactive rather than being a, and now this has happened and so here we are, right? In the same way we know the importance of sex education for neurotypical individuals, we can say, you know, it's equally if not more important for this population as well. Here are some resources. Um, and I can certainly put these back up at the end or send them to the group. Um, but there's some great websites on um, by uh, Organization for Autism Research. Dr. Eileen Crehan, who I've mentioned several times, has an entire resources uh, page of her website. Many of these are included in that resources page, I'm sure. UCLA Peers for Dating, Planned Parenthood. There's a few curriculums um, that I, you know, encourage people to take a look at. Um, and yeah. And then my information is here um, as well as the information for our group practice. And if anyone's interested in either individual or treatment um, or, or any of our groups, um, they're welcome to email info at spectrumpsychla.com. But mostly I'm also just really passionate about this topic, excited to talk about it and um, happy to happy to talk more unrelated to treatment as well. So with that, I can leave this resources page up for a moment. I'm sure people will want to take a look at it. 
All right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Barstein, for such a thorough and informative talk. Um, I really appreciate your practical takeaways, particularly distinguishing myth versus fact and just what and how to teach, um, as well as the resources, which I know you'll be sharing with us. Um, and for our audience, the PDF of Dr. Barstein's slides will be sent out in a couple of weeks. Um, and so feel free, Dr. Barstein, you can take down the slide for now um, and we will and send them out to everyone here. Um, I know, uh, or I especially love how today you modeled how we can normalize a lot of these topics, mm -hmm. um, as well as how to navigate these often tricky um, or uncomfortable, awkward conversations with autistic individuals. Um, I know we have a lot of questions from the audience, so please, everyone, please enter your questions into the Q&A, um, but I'll start us off with a question for Dr. Barstein. Um, so broadly, I'm wondering, so at what age uh, should we talk to our children or clients about sex, um, and how do we know that they're ready to talk about some of these things? Yeah, this is a great question that's frequently asked. Um, I mean, I think we can think about this in terms of other skills as well, right? Um, the reality is what we don't want to do, and I know I've highlighted this several times, we don't want to wait until it's too late. So we want to think about what kind of information are they getting outside of the home, right? What are, who is their peer group, right? And what kind of information are they hearing? Are they listening to? Um, and so that's one of the ways that might tell us, even if they don't seem totally ready to talk about it and have questions, at least giving them this information um, and starting to educate around the facts, especially can be really important to ensure safety. Uh, there's also some of the resources I put up. There's some really great sites around like how to talk about certain topics at specific ages, right? And so there might be certain topics that a child isn't ready for until they're a leader in adolescence. Um, but I do hear often, especially I work a lot with young adults, um, is that they feel like because no one was really telling them or teaching them, they were having to kind of seek information on their own, oftentimes getting misinformation, um, invalid information, or, you know, just felt like kind of isolated. And so I do think um, starting to have these conversations and starting to educate sooner rather than later, you know, in that really that pre-adolescent age is going to be really important. If anyone's seeing, you know, signs of um, maybe aberrant sexual behaviors and or sexual behaviors that might seem kind of out of the norm, absolutely consulting with their medical provider, consulting with a, you know, a, a clinical psychologist or another clinician to really talk about, you know, what does this mean and how can we make sure that we're intervening and looking at this at a, at an early, at an early age? Absolutely. I think that that relates to that concept that you had referenced, counterfeit deviance, mm -hmm. um, and that this is it, uh, you know, this comes from some ASD associated impairments, but really everything is a skill. Everything mm -hmm. can be learned. Exactly. It all comes to how we individualize the information that we're teaching um, and making it really applicable for that person. Yeah. Um, so I really love that. Um, and I'll add to, I often hear families say, well, developmentally, they're just not there yet, right? Like mm -hmm. they're just more maybe socially naive or socially immature. And to me, I kind of say, well, that's all the more reason to, to teach this, right? Mm -hmm. Is that and thinking about the physical maturation is equal, right? And so the feelings are there, even if the, the social maturity or the social understanding isn't there, this is all the more reason for us to really explain what is happening to your body, what is going to happen to your body, what does this mean normalizing it, right? Um, and so I think, you know, thinking about developmental level, yes, but also really thinking about that skill-based support. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I appreciate that a lot. Um, so I'm also curious, so you talked about the group program, um, mm -hmm. Tackling Teenage Training. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the group and any opportunities to get involved? I know that several families in the chat are interested in curriculum and yeah. how they can get access to this, but we'd love to hear more about the group. Yeah, right now it is not a published manual. Um, there are, um, so it's actually in, in Dutch and it was translated into English um, for Dr. Crehan's studies who I've been very lucky to collaborate with. Um, she does have, if you check out her website, she might have some, I, I can't remember if she's still enrolling, but opportunities to get involved in the uh, individual adaptation. So it's a, it's an individual program. It's not a group program, but we have adapt, we've adapted it into a group program. 
Um, and so there might be some opportunities to get involved in the individual level. Um, otherwise, if you have a young adult, um, you're certainly welcome to contact the, the our, my contact information, um, I think will be sent out and was also is also on our website. And we'd be happy to tell you more about groups that we might be running, um, or any other groups that there might be in the area. But essentially, this tackling teenage training program um, is a really great program. It's very explicit. It's much more explicit than a lot of the programs that we've seen here in the U.S. Um, and it's designed to be 16 weeks. Uh, again, designed to be one-on-one -on -one for kind of the, the adolescent age, but we piloted it in a young adult group, uh, 18 to 25. And, um, you know, individuals really liked it. They felt like they learned a lot. And again, some of the components I think that were most useful, which we also see in the UCLA peers programs, is that peer, that actual peer component, right, is being able to, to talk to other individuals who are experiencing similar difficulties um, and or, you know, have similar um, social situations or really just similar sexual experiences or different sexual experience, just to be able to talk about that with, with a group and normalize it and provide a safe space for it. Right. I think we have, you know, at myself having been in the Peers Young Adults program for several years, my main experience there was really in normalizing a lot of the questions yes. and uh, motivations that a lot of our adults had. Um, Cause I think most of the time they were just curious, is this what other people experienced too? Yeah. And yeah. it's so great to have that group space to be able to discuss and to, again, have a peer group where they can learn um, information that is accurate, um, that is mm -hmm. appropriate, and that is actually practical and helpful for them. Yeah. And you made me think of one thing I didn't mention when you said, is mm -hmm. this normal? One of the things that I encourage um, clients to do, and we certainly encourage it in the group, is to look at yourself, right? Like leave the group mm -hmm. tonight, go home, grab a mirror, look at yourself in the mirror, right? Understand mm -hmm. what, what's really there. What, what do you really have? What are your parts? What do they look like? Um, get getting to know your own body, right. And your own self before you can even think about really in your in your, you know, engaging with, um, a partner or with someone else. And I think even just that piece just feels so validating for so many mm -hmm. people of like, okay, this is a space for me to understand and to know like, this is normal, right? Other people have mm -hmm. this and see this and do this, um, either the social aspects of it or the physical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and as you had said that this is a space where you can ask those kinds of questions mm -hmm. that you feel would be uncomfortable or weird yeah, in exactly. any other space. Uh, I love that. Um, so I'm looking at some of the themes in our Q&A and thank you everyone for um, inputting your questions into the Q&A function. I'm noticing one of the themes is really on how um, clinicians can approach these types of conversations with parents um, mm -hmm. or in educational settings where parents are a little resistant or hesitant to um, to offer sex education for their neurodivergent youth or, um, or, at, or a young adult? That's a great question. Um, and I think that we experience this frequently, right? And this relates to your question of how do I know if my child is ready and when mm -hmm. is my child ready? I do think it's important for parents to understand and know the facts and the reality of the risks of, you know, that counterfeit deviance concept, the risks, risks of sexual exploitation exploitation as well as sexual mm -hmm. uh, perpetration. And so I think, you know, trying to really, first of all, meet parents where they're at, really understand their cultural beliefs, understand their family situation, their morals, right? How can we, how can we meet you in that space where you're understanding that this is important because of safety reasons, but also that we're doing this in a way that feels comfortable for you, right? And so for some parents and for some, you know, um, adults, we were very transparent about the type of group that we run. It is very explicit. We really don't hold back. And that isn't for everyone. It might need to be a slower approach for some people and, or they might not be ready to engage around peers in that, you know, kind of group. But I think the biggest thing is to really provide education um, for parents, again, using some of these statistics that you learned here today and just highlighting why we want to be proactive and preventative and at least the skills, right? The skills to be able to advocate for yourself, to say no, to cope with that, right? To understand the peer pressure. Those are really things that we need to be able to teach um, our neurodivergent population, um, regardless of how, you know, explicit we're being with the sex education piece, recognizing that maybe we'll get to that. But at least for now, we really want to make sure that the child is safe. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And really establishing that foundational skill of bodily autonomy Mm -hmm. and that you have a say and you have consent. Um, Because I think that that is something that is also often not taught early for many children um, and is an important aspect for additional skills, whether it is, um, you know, sex education or navigating relationships, any of those things down the line. But I think that's such a great point. Okay, well, I'm noticing time. Um, I do want to uh, just thank you, Dr. Barstein, for such an excellent talk. I know that this is a highly requested topic and there's so many questions in the chat that unfortunately we don't have time to get to. So for our audience, um, you're welcome to reach out to Dr. Barstein um, through your contact information. Um, Dr. Barstein, feel free to put it into the chat or you can share the slide um, on the screen. Um, But the slides will be sent out in a couple weeks um, and the recording for Dr. Dr. Barstein's talk will also be available on the Tarjan Center website and our YouTube channel. Um, I'm also going to lastly do a plug for our Tarjan Center plain language podcast called In Other Words, which digests um, our Tarjan Center lecture series into brief 10 to 15 minute podcasts where our uh, lecture speakers like Dr. Barstein are interviewed by our self-advocacy and community liaison, Keisha Weller, um, and really just provides the talk into um, a shorter, more accessible format. Um, So with that, thank you so much, Dr. Barstein, for this wonderful talk. It was a pleasure having you and being able to chat um, together. Um, Looking forward to hearing about the wonderful things that you're doing with your group um, and collaborating further. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.